This thing has a reason. Normally I uh, have Bob coming in to the tune of Wire, but uh, you might recognize that as the Stray Cat theme from, uh, I, I guess it's the group, the Stray Cats, and uh, it, it's very familiar. Um, I, uh, Bob had called to my attention today of all the things happening in the state of Connecticut. There is a bill, and I'm going to show it to you. Um, it is proposed House Bill number 5874, and it is uh, sponsored by a representative, Kelly J.S. Luxembourg of the 12th District. And I'm reading the title, and folks, I kid you not, an act requiring the licensing of cats. Here we are in the state of Connecticut in 2017 with some terrible problems facing the state, and we're talking about licensing cats, but who better to talk about it with than my pal, professor, and good friend, Bob Swick. Bob, how are you this evening? Very good, Tony. Thanks for having me on tonight. My pleasure. And I, you know, when you had shown this to me this morning, I was very happy I was sitting in a chair with arms. And, uh, and full disclosure, I've got four of these little creatures. I'm married to one of these women who go to the shelters and they end up with like one and maybe another and then another. And, you know, I live in a cat house, so uh, this would be a mortgage for me. And I'm trying to keep this light, but I, I don't believe it. What can you tell us? Well, I... I... My wife and I are cat lovers also, and uh, we're, we're, we have had many cats over the years. What this bill is attempting to do, in my opinion, is just a money grab from pet owners. She feels that she's going to get $8.6 million to come into the state. If, according to her estimation, over 800,000 state cats become licensed, and I tried to do on the math that she came up with this, and uh, she quoted a few different sites on it. And it's totally illogical to me how you could come up with 800,000 cats in the state of Connecticut, and how are you going to come up with $8.6 million to be generated by them? And I'll point out right now, we have 360 different fees of taxes in the state of Connecticut, this being number 361, is the most irrational, illogical, the bill I've ever seen in, in years. So it, it makes no sense whatsoever. And as my wife said tonight, well, what do you do with Pharaoh now? Are we going to run out and try to uh, license them? Or how does that work? I mean, it, it makes no sense whatsoever. It really doesn't. Well, and, and I mean, I, I'm going to raise a couple of things to you. Um, I, I live in an area which is known as quote unquote rural residential, it's zoned rural residential. Uh, and the, the, the boundaries between properties are not necessarily clearly defined. There, a lot of them are, you know, fragments of a stone wall from the revolution or perhaps a chicken wire from a farm. And, you know, uh, truth be told, we have a number of cats that kind of wander the back here and there and every once in a while I might throw them a scrap or two because frankly I want them out there killing the mice. Now, do I have to license these cats? Right, and, uh, and again, I don't, I don't understand how you can license a feral cat. Technically, you're not supposed to, you know, be near a feral cat because they may be uh, carrying something. Brave. So, the, the, to me, the whole thing is so illogical, it's not even funny. And it's not spelled out in the bill. I couldn't find any information on feral cats. I think she would be laughed up the uh, house floor if she actually, you know, brought up about licensing feral cats at the same time. And you're correct. A cat is a hunter, and they're going to go after mice, they're going to go after workers, they're going to go after insects. That's what they need if they're true, you know, a true binary cat. So, it, it, yeah, this, this is a, such a stupid waste of time that Connecticut taxpayers have to deal with not everything else going on with this thing. Well, and, and not only that, and, I, and I'll just raise this from here, the... Um, most of the cats, I believe, that come into homes come through these very hard-working, saving their pennies, poverty-stricken volunteer shelters. Now, is this going to be a compliance burden on these shelters to have to... Now, now, your guess is as good as mine. There's no mention on that. I do agree with that. I mean, we help the American uh, Humane Society over here, which is right there in Wallingford over here. And I'm saying to myself, they can barely afford... Uh, I know. How are they going to afford this? 
It's insane. Well, as we said at the top... Just reading the several articles I read today and trying to get more information on the law, so reading a lot of reader reactions Yeah, yeah, and then politely put, with so many bigger issues before this state and so many critical and so many things happening, I know uh, one of the things we had talked about earlier was uh, what is happening with the uh, the budget and the debt crisis, and I, you, know, you hear a lot of happy talk, but yet you don't really see anything like, uh, I, I still see the water coming in through the bottom of the boat. Well, it's coming rapidly. That's all I can say. I, I think what's going to happen is Governor Malloy is waiting for his budget address. I think he's going to drop a couple bombshells on the, on, on the state with regards to cutting spending and at the same time raising taxes because there's no other way that we can address figure number a $1 billion budget deficit, a $1.5 billion budget deficit, and so on and so forth. There has been no mention whatsoever from either party, and this is what really annoys me, is that you have such an upper, uh, over, upper level management system in the state of Connecticut government, it's not even funny. With so many different commissioners, assistant commissioners, assistant managers, so on and so forth, which basically are not doing anything whatsoever, which are causing a big part of the grain in the state budget as far as salaries benefits and pensions are concerned. And I do point out that there are many individuals who work for the state of Connecticut in very high paid jobs right. to pay zero to their pension. And they come out with an incredible pension, a pension that you and I could never touch in a lifetime because they are entitled to these different benefit packages, pension packages. It, it's like a it's like a surf to a a, a surf up here with regards to the way they treat it. That's the area, in my opinion, that really needs to be addressed quickly and rapidly. If they want to give them a pension, 7% of their salary goes into the, to a self-funded pension. That's it. No question of that. Well, in the... pension away. And at the same time, I, I'll point out um, the, the two senators, state senators, resigned before the session started. One of them, Eric Holm, and the Democrat out of Bloomfield, is going to be appointed as a judge. He only has to work until age 70 because that's the mandatory retirement age for judges of the state of Connecticut. His pension is going to be 70% of his highest salary as a judge for the rest of his life. And how can you work for five years in a job and then receive 70% of your salary for the rest of your life? It's beyond me. It is completely beyond me. Well, and I'm not, you're, you're an economist, I'm a tired, jaded tax trust and estates guy, but I do understand a little bit about present value mathematics and life expectancies and things like that. And the present value as an asset of a pension of a 70-year-old who's expected to live to maybe 86 or something like that, at some whopping amount, I mean, you are, in, and with a 50% joint and survivor, you are talking one major asset. Right. I mean, if you look at it, it's like 10, 10 uh, this was my, my uh, example I, I talked about before, 10 judges all retire at the same time at age 7. They all went to age 9, 20 years of a pension of $70,000 plus times how many different people, not just them, but other people throughout the state. It's such a burden on the state budget. It's not even funny anymore. You cannot get returns short playing, you know, going to the casino, gambling every night to try to get the returns they claim they can't get yet in order to fund the pension system. And, and it just can't be funded this way anymore. Both management and union pensions need to be addressed. They need to be cut. There needs to be more of a uh, contribution by the employee into the system if they're going to be just generous with them. And they need to cut it back. I mean, there's, there's no way it can be sustained. It's bankrupting the state of Canada. Is there, in your estimation, um, any, how could I put it, um, 
Uh, now, it's, in, in your estimation, I mean, to me this looks obvious, the way you describe it even more so. Is anyone on either side of the aisle seeing this and that we really have to deal with it? Well, I really don't, I don't really, I, I, you know, honestly, I don't see it. Some of the Republicans came out with a plan where they have a, uh, they're trying to create what's known as, what they're calling a sustainable budget, where they're going to balance the budget, and more importantly, they're going to want to have state spending and have a real productive people in this state who would pay higher taxes. I'm, again, I'm trying to wrap my not even arguable pea brain around this. Where's it going to come from? They started with that last year, yes. They want to increase that one dollar a year for the next five years and boost it to fifteen dollars in five years from now. Which being which tells me that anytime you're going to a grocery store now, you'll be checking yourself out because there's not gonna be any more cash here. And the uh, same thing when you go to a gas station and every other small store and or large chain store, like a Walmart or whatever. Well, and the problem with that, as I was telling, I'm going to use a, uh, a Rick Elzean term, hockey puck legislator last year is, and he said to me, but you're a small business, you're exempt. I said, well, I'm only exempt to the degree that uh, my young intern, whom I'm paying $13 an hour for, and she's grateful to have a job, she works it around her school schedule, um, finds out that the Walmart will give her $2 more and I'm left without an intern. individuals within that particular location, community, state, and so on and so forth. 
Well, you end up like Great Britain, pretty much. That's that's Correct. what that's right. what happens. I mean, why, why do you have massive unemployment in so many different European countries? Well, for the simple reason, between a limited work week of maybe 30, 32 hours a week, and again, at a, a way above equilibrium minimum wage, you don't have to hire anybody. You know, you don't have to be an economist to figure this out. If you're a small business owner like yourself, and I know many of them, they say, I can't afford labor. So I have to do everything myself and or I will outsource many, many things. And as such, I can't hire anybody. I'd love to hire somebody, but I can't do it. I can't afford it. I am I, I, I will relate. Real. I, I, I will relate. And I, well, what, what can we say? We'll, we'll keep watching, but it's, uh, I, you notice, at least with me, I mean, as far as uh, when I'm dealing with the state these days, and it's like, uh, I've had a couple of questions out to uh, departments here and there. You saw last week I was talking to the DOT about their wonderful paving job on 91. Uh, where they pretty much admitted to me, oh, we screwed up, we'll fix it when we get more federal money, gee, thanks. Uh, that's real economic development, folks. And there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of desire, and I hate to generalize, you know, my, my eighth grade teacher, Mary Jo Barisi, God rest her soul, would always say, Mr. D'Angelo, you're dealing in glittering generalities, but here I'm going to deal in a glittering generality. It, it, it seems like I'm dealing with a bunch of Joe Bessers. Hey, I want to, you, you know, and, and, and at the state level, and I, I, I don't get it. I, yeah, I agree with you 100%. You know, I drive every day through the, what I call the great uh, pyramids of New Haven, which is the improvement on I 95 there, because it's the 91 merger. And I drive through the streets of the city, and I see the same thing every day. You know, it's like the Great Pyramid of New Haven. And I say to myself, how many years do they need to do this? It, it makes no sense to me whatsoever. And I'm not sure by the time it's done, it's going to be outdated, and it will still won't be able to handle the traffic flow. Well, as it was supposed to. Well, what was it? It, it, again, no logical waste of taxpayers' money. And again, it, it, from a pure economics point of view, our state has squandered so much taxpayers' money over the past 30 years, it's not even funny. We should not be near last in all so many different economic categories the way we are today. It's, and I think of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, California, was assembled in four months during the end of the Great Depression, uh, and it's still in service today. I <laughs> it just amazes me. In, in our closing moments, and believe me, we're going to have a lot to talk about getting into the spring, so uh, get your, uh, your warm-up pitches in. Um, I noticed there's been some uh, talk again of uh, let's have tolls on the highways. Uh, I'm sorry, I Let's have tolls on the highways. Oh, yeah, tolls. Um, I, I want to point out real quick, Senator Lenny Susio, a Republican emeritus, has proposed Senate Bill number 76 to prohibit the expenditure of state monies to do a mileage tax study. One proposal on the hardware is to actually put it like a, some sort of GPS unit to track your miles uh, that you drive in the state. Another proposal is to have tolls at uh, all entrances into the state. I do point out, I believe I-91 really did not have tolls on it for uh, some uh, something that was written into that actual contract when that I was built. So you'll be looking at the Maryland Parkway 9584, all logical areas where they would want to be uh, told by camera if you did not have your pass or whatever unit that to drive through it, you would get a uh, envelope in the mail shortly after to pay the toll. Ridiculous, another uh, bureaucratic boondoggle on the part of Connecticut that they really think is going to gain that much money. They're in for a rude awakening on that one, too. Well, and, and really, uh, any anything that you do, you need people to administrate it and you have to pay them and you're back on the benefits gravy train again, but I guess we're not supposed to know about that. That's true, that's true. It's a big secret. It's the big secret of Hartford. You know, who does what, where, and why, and for how much, and what is the purpose of it, is beyond me. It, it's amazing. In our final closing moments, your impressions of our new president 
and how he's being perceived and what you expect to see in the days that, uh, uh, coming ahead. I, I personally, I'll, I'll bring up two points. Listen to his inaugurational speech. I thought it was excellent. I think he really turned the Washington upside down and backwards. Uh, and I We only needed Bob, and again, thanks, thanks for coming on, and uh, you'll be back with us, I'm sure, as the plot thickens. Uh, again, where can our friends and fans reach you and read your blogs and follow your activities? Okay, my blog, Swiftspeak, blogspot.com. I'm also on Apple Report 2017. Just do a quick search for Bob Swift. I'm there, and uh, don't forget our Twitter Magazine, our podcast. Yeah, a whole lot of fun when you get into that old football stuff. Bob, thanks. Best to everyone. We'll be sure to be talking soon. Thank you, Tony. Good night. And that was our pal, our friend of the show, Bob Swick, telling us about all things happening in government, primarily local and some national. And we're going to be coming back with some retro commercials, and after that, some historical happenings in January. A lot happened in January other than snow. We'll see you in just a bit.